Okay. So as Wendy mentioned, I work at quite a few places around the community and I did grow up in DuPage. I grew up in Downers Grove and um, work in Naperville. My parents still live in Downers Grove and um, I live in Kendall County now and actually at the Conservation Foundation where I work, um, we're actually in Will County. We're right on the border there in Will. So, um, but I've been in this area for all of my life and I've been around gardening all of my life, um, but specifically myself having my own gardens that I've been responsible for. That's been, I was doing the math a little bit earlier and thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's actually been that long, but yeah, 24 years. So. Um, before that, when I was younger, I did help my parents and my grandparents. They all had gardens, um, but my very first one that I had of my own was about 23 or 24 years ago. 20, you know, I was 24, 24 plus even. Um, so here's my information. If anyone needs to reach me after the presentation or if you have questions or anything you want to follow up with, this is my email at the Conservation Foundation, so you can reach me there, and there's the website so you can learn a little bit more about the Conservation Foundation. A lot of you may already be familiar and um, may even be members of the Conservation Foundation. And if not though, I'll just give you a really quick intro here. Um, we are a nonprofit and we've been around since 1972. We're located in Naperville and our mission is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open space, protecting rivers and watersheds, and promoting stewardship of our environment. And that all definitely ties into organic gardening, which I'll touch on more in just a minute. Um, we're also very proud to be accredited by the Land Trust Foundation. That's a really big accomplishment, so we're very excited about that. Um, so. Our goal, what we're trying to do, we say, to, just to make it very simple, we save land, we save rivers, and we're trying to improve the health of our communities. So some of the ways that we do that, that relate to organic growing would be, first of all, Green Earth Harvest is a part of the Conservation Foundation. Our location in Naperville is on a 60 acre farm, the McDonald farm, 45 acres of that is in organic production food production, so vegetables, herbs, and all kinds of goodies, fruit. Um, and so we provide those things to the community in several different ways. There's, um, we offer farm shares where you can pay some money and then pick up your weekly share of the harvest. And we have different seasons for that, spring, summer, fall. We um, participate in the farmer's market, which actually this year due to COVID was canceled. We didn't get to do that, um, but we did have a roadside a little farm stand down at the end of our drive. So even if people weren't able to get a share, especially this year, um, everything was sold out so quickly. And I think when we saw empty shelves at the stores, a lot of people then had an even bigger interest in being able to get local food, grow their own. Um, and so if they weren't able to get a farm share, they were still able to get um, fresh organic fruits and vegetables at the, the farm stand at the end of the driveway down there at the farm, which was fantastic. Um, so we also do all kinds of education. So for families and kids, as an environmental educator, we teach not only about nature and families of plants and animals and ecosystems and all of that interaction, but also gardening. So we will have uh, what we've been calling family adventures where people can come out. We have a set time and come out as a family and um, we'll have stations set up where an educator will lead a, a little session on nature and then a little session on gardening or farming and then have some activities. So those have been a lot of fun. We also do nature on the farm camps and we've got a whole brand new children's garden this year with raised beds that um, and compost bins and different things, fruit trees and shrubs, where we're showing examples of what people can do in their own backyard and how they can grow their own organic flowers, fruits, vegetables, herbs. And, um, and we're teaching the kids how to do that, teaching their parents and the families how to do that. But at the Nature on the Farm camps, the kids got to actually plant things, water them, grow them, harvest. And we had harvests from the garden every day for our snacks at camp, which was a lot of fun. 
And um, so the kids were making some tea with herbs they picked and um, obviously we had veggies and salads, but they got to make homemade salad dressing to put on their salads and all kinds of things. And they were really, really great at trying and being, um, they had a really good interest. They were really engaged in the process. They got to, they got really excited about pulling things, um, pulling onions and picking cucumbers and all this stuff, they, they loved it. And um, we also learned all about nature, the pollinators and the things that we need to make those things grow, composting and all that. So, so it's a lot of fun. So this is a lot of what we do at the farm that incorporates nature and organic growing in a lot of different ways. So that's just kind of um, part of what we do there. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone has that intro so that if you haven't been to the farm too, that's another thing too, some people don't realize the farm is actually open during regular business hours and you can come and visit. So there are picnic tables, you can pack a lunch and come out and have a little hike. Um, aside from the farm areas, we have some wetland restoration, a little woodland trail. We have examples of a rain garden and a pollinator garden and all kinds of different things. So it's just a beautiful place to come and spend some time and, and get outdoors. So you are all welcome to come and do that. So for organic gardening though, one of the main goals when we talk about organic gardening, we think of limiting our use of synthetic chemicals like pesticides and herbicides, but we tend to think of those things specifically for vegetables. And that makes sense because if we're picking vegetables, we have that direct connection between picking that and eating it. So that's where we have it in the forefront of our minds that we don't want chemicals, um, you know, or, or harmful products of any of any kind on that food that we're about to eat. But a lot of times that means then we forget that organic gardening can apply to all gardening. So we can grow also our flowers, our herbs, if you have native plants or ornamentals, you can grow all of those things organically. So um, that's just one thing that I always like to clarify that we're not just talking about vegetables. It's definitely important for the things we're eating, but it's also important just as a way to support ecosystems and our environment in general, even if we're growing things that we don't intend to eat. Something probably intends to eat those, <laughs> there maybe it's um, insects taking a little nibble here or there, or some animals coming through your yard. And that's why I love this sign that says, if something is not eating your plants, then your garden is not part of the ecosystem. And that actually is a really good thing to remember. We think so long and hard about all the ways we can pre prevent everything else from nibbling on the plants in our gardens. Sometimes we forget that it's okay that they need to eat too, and a little bit isn't going to really do any harm. And we are helping to support our little part of the ecosystem. So especially when we're newer, this is one of the things that I like to say, if you're going to learn anything at all about organic gardening, if you only know one thing, the one thing that I would always try to remember is that we're trying to grow with nature. We're working with nature, not against it. So a good way to do that is if you're ever unsure of how to manage something in your garden or how to handle something, you can just ask yourself, what would, what would happen in nature? What would nature do? So when we observe nature and we try to mimic those natural processes that just happen on their own without any interference from us, that's typically our best bet to try to, if we can emulate that and replicate some of those things then our gardens can manage themselves with less work from us. So this is the whole main idea to me in anything we're doing when we're gardening organically, we're just trying to support these natural ecosystems, protect our land, protect our water, because by doing those things, especially when we're growing, growing food, you know, like I said, we, we think of that if we have clean soil, healthy soil, we have healthy plants. If we have clean water, we have healthy plants and then those healthy plants feed us. But across the board, we're feeding other things too. We're supporting the whole ecosystem. So that's the main focus, the main goal, and the main thing to remember when we come across challenges in the garden. Like, well, how would this how would this resolve itself in nature? How would this be managed if I were to step back and do nothing? How would nature handle this? And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So a lot of times people ask, 
where do I start? I want to garden organically, but I have no idea where to even start or how, how to do this or how to get started. So the very first thing, just like any plant, we start usually with seeds or we might buy little plants that we call starts or seedlings or uh, whatever we wanna call them. But if we can get those right from the very beginning, um, if we're buying organic seeds and organic little plant starts, we're already getting a head start. It is possible to buy a plant or to buy seeds that are not organic and then grow them organically using organic methods. However, it's shopping with our dollars. And if we, if we can avoid buying plants that may have been treated, then we are not supporting that system where somewhere else, even though we're not seeing it, somewhere else, somebody is growing these things and using the chemicals and doing it. So if we're trying to avoid that for our own growing, if we can avoid buying something that was started in that way, um, at least it's still good to, once we get it into our hands and we're taking care of it, if we can do everything organically going forward, that's fantastic. But if it's possible to take it a step back further and control right back to the very beginning and get organic seeds and organic plants, then that's even better. Um, so then we're supporting the whole ecosystem at large beyond just our space, our growing space, whether that's our patio, our yard, you know, our kitchen countertop, if you're doing a little indoor herb garden, we can control our space. But the only way that we can help to influence the other growing spaces is by hopefully not um, putting our dollars toward methods that we aren't using ourselves. So it's just kind of supporting that whole system beyond just what we are doing. So another thing too, <laughs> I like, I'll start with this picture that I have here first, the oranges and the strawberries. So one of the things that we can do also right from the beginning is when we choose what we want to grow, we want to choose things that actually want to grow here, <laughs> that actually want to grow in our space. So rather than trying to grow an orange tree, which I'm sure I could do, and I'm sure there are some <clears throat> more sustainable ways to do that than others, but it still is going to be resource intensive because oranges don't naturally want to grow here. So they're going to need extra support in terms of heating, lighting, you know, all of those types of things. You can maybe do passive solar, you can work something out, but generally speaking, an orange tree is going to be much more difficult to grow here because it doesn't want to grow here naturally. Strawberries do. So by choosing things that want to grow here and will grow here without all of that extra work, um, we are eliminating the need for all of these inputs down the road and during the whole growing process. So if we're reducing the need for extra support for these plants, because they're able to do a lot of, um, they're resilient and they're able to do a lot of their growing and their work on their own, we can reduce the amount of fertilizer we need, we can reduce our watering, we can reduce the use of pesticides, um, and all of those other inputs in terms of, like I mentioned, heat, electricity, added lighting, you know, all of these other things. So as an example, if you have an area of your yard that's a little more moist, that would be a great spot to maybe grow elderberries or grow cucumbers, grow something that likes the moisture and really wants that type of environment rather than growing something like carrots that may rot in that wet, wet soil. So it's going to be so much more work to try to grow carrots in that space than it would be to just grow something that wants to grow in those wetter conditions to begin with. If you have an area with heavy clay, which is very common in, around here in our area, that might be a good spot where you can grow cabbage, lettuce, Swiss chard, um, all of those things should do pretty well in a heavier clay soil. That's not to say don't amend the soil or add organic matter and try to improve that heavy clay. That's fine. That's fantastic. That's a really good thing to work toward. But if you want to plant something right now while you're working to improve that soil, let's choose some things that can grow in clay soil a little bit more readily than um, something that would struggle and would need a lot of extra help to do that. 
if you have an area with a little bit of shade, you can grow lettuce. Tomatoes are going to struggle and they're going to need a lot more support and inputs. So it's just making those choices and knowing your growing conditions and knowing what wants to grow there. And over time, you can still, like I said, you can improve those areas or you can change things, but it's much easier to plant something that wants to grow rather than something that, um, like I used to joke about um, <laughs> some of these plants that we choose to try to grow sometimes, it's almost like a challenge or like, you know, um, it's this real sense of accomplishment if we can get this thing to live because it really doesn't want to grow here. And it's almost, um, I would joke that we would have to like sing it lullabies, you know, and like tuck it in at night and like they need all this extra attention and care. Um, but that's not always the best when we're trying to reduce our input. So it's, it is easier to just grow something that wants to grow anyway. Um, and so another example I have on here is low nutrient soil. Again, you can amend it and, and there, you definitely want to have good healthy soil, which we'll also talk about in a minute. But in the meantime, while you're working on it or while you're starting a new garden area, do yourself a favor and maybe grow something like beans that will do okay in that soil and could actually add nitrogen to the soil as opposed to something like broccoli that's a really heavy feeder and isn't going to do well in a low nutrient soil and you're gonna to have to be adding a bunch of fertilizer and things to support it so that it will grow and thrive and not just fall over and you know <laughs> give up on you. <laughs> so speaking of the soil, um, this is another thing. This is so important for for really any gardening, but especially when we're trying to grow organically, if we can avoid treating our lawns and, and there are organic lawn care companies as well. And just like how I was talking about seeds and our little plant starts, there are places, there are resources. Um, and I can probably help with that if anybody needs ideas that can, I can always give you some later, but um, there are places that will sell organic seeds or seedlings and places that do offer organic lawn care. So it's not that you can't ever do anything to your yard. We're just really trying to, you know, and especially it depends on where you live. And I understand we've got neighbors and sometimes homeowners associations and, and things. And, um, you know, I'm not saying to just don't ever do anything to the yard, but if we can reduce those inputs that really aren't needed, aren't needed as often, um, or could maybe be when we could manage things in the yard in other ways, that can be much more beneficial. Um, so using our grass clippings as mulch, either just leaving them in place to add back to the soil can help actually create a healthier lawn or using those clippings elsewhere in the garden, whether it's in your compost pile or putting them around your other garden plants as mulch that can be very beneficial. And by using any kind of mulch, we are reducing our weeding. We're reducing, um, so if we're reducing the amount of weeds that are popping up, we're reducing our need for herbicides. If we can keep the water held in the soil, we're reducing our inputs of having to water extra because of evaporation and, and letting that water go. So we're saving our resources and trying to be wise. And, um, these things can also be nitrogen and carbon sources for our compost pile. And if left in place, they can be, they can act as a slow release fertilizer. They'll break down on their own over time. Even if you happen to mow over the leaves, so they're in smaller pieces, that will help speed up the process, but you can leave them in place. And if any of you have heard of the Leave the Leaves campaign or the Healthy Yards groups, um, this is, Right now is the time of year where there's a lot of information, a lot of resources out there about the benefits of leaving the leaves and not breaking them up, packing them away and hauling them off site. If we can close those loops and keep them on site and use them for something here, um, then that's, that's beneficial. It also could be home and nesting for beneficial insects. And if we're hauling this stuff away and just removing it from the site, we are removing part of that ecosystem and some of those beneficial insects that could potentially help us in our gardens next season. So it's better if we can leave them in place or at least leave them on site, even if you don't leave them all across your yard, but if you can move them to your compost bin or move them to your garden beds to act as that mulch and winterize and tuck your beds in for winter by insulating with that layer of leaves, that's great. 
um, adding the grass clippings and the leaves to anywhere in your garden or leaving them in place, you're adding organic matter and nutrients that are feeding the soil food web, which I'm gonna talk about with composting. So composting, this one I love to talk about, but it gets a little bit, um, it gets a little tricky for some people that until you get the hang of it, um, Jody and I, when we teach, Jody Trendler is the um, one of the founders of the Resiliency Institute, and we both teach the composting class at COD. And we both kind of like to say it's um, it's an it's a science and an art. So there's a little bit of a balance here. It's a little bit of science for sure. There's also a little bit of an art to it. There's it's a little bit of an art form. So the science behind it. I think is what can sometimes trip people up or can, can make it seem more confusing than it actually really needs to be. A lot of times people will say that they tried composting, but they just, it just kind of turned into a mushy, smelly mess. And I think a very common mistake is that people will just throw their compost, um, like their kitchen scraps into a pile, and then they, they don't really have the full balance that's needed. So there are a few things that I'll just touch on quickly because I can do a whole, whole separate time to send the composting. Um, but if we think about compost in terms of, first of all, another common misconception, compost itself is not a fertilizer. Compost is a soil amendment. So the compost typically, you can find some that have higher nutrient levels, but typically it has a low level of nutrients. But what it is full of that's super important are all of the microbes and the things that are working to break down that organic matter, the organic materials in the soil. And what that does by breaking them down into tiny pieces, it makes those nutrients more readily available to your plants. So the effect can be as if you gave it a fertilizer, but really it's more of a long-term solution and it's helping the plants to be able to absorb the nutrients they need from the soil. So, that's what we need to remember when we're trying to compost is the microorganisms. What we're actually doing is trying to raise these little organisms. So it's not so much about um, what you're putting in, that's definitely part of it, your inputs. But if we think in terms of keeping these little microorganisms alive, because they're what are doing all of the work for us here, then it becomes a little bit easier to manage these compost piles. Because if we think about what we need to live, in terms of biology and being living beings, we need food, sort of the microorganisms. So that's the inputs that you're putting in there. You've got carbons and nitrogens, and there, there does need to be a little bit of a balance there because if you have too much nitrogen, you get that sloppy, stinky mess. If you have too much carbon, it might be too dry and the process won't be happening um, correctly. But, um, in addition to the inputs, the food, we need water. If we didn't have any water to drink, we would dehydrate and <laughs> we would not survive for very long without water. So do the microorganisms, they need water also, but not too much water, just like us, they would drown. And that would create also an anaerobic situation. And again, that's where we get some odors and different things going on. So we need food, we need water, we need air. We need air to breathe. We can't have too much water or we'll drown. So air. So the compost pile needs to be turned and aerated and then temperature and all, so it's all of these same things that we need to live if we make sure that the microorganisms in our compost pile are getting those same things the air the water the food um, and keeping them at the right temperature for example in the freezing conditions over winter probably not a whole lot is going to be happening because it'll go dormant um, but those are the things we need to do to try to get that balance and create this really wonderful compost. And by adding that compost then with all those little microorganisms to our garden beds, to our soil, then all those microbes are in place, breaking down the organic material and making nutrients readily available for your plants. Healthier plants that have the nutrients, think of it like taking our vitamins and eating a healthy diet, those healthy plants are then more resistant to pests and they don't require as much pesticide use. They can be more resistant to um, even some diseases. So just in general, making those nutrients available to your plants makes them so much stronger and healthier. 
Um, and it really does go a long way in reducing those inputs again in terms of your pesticides and things because your plants will already be resistant. So since I mentioned the compost itself isn't directly a fertilizer, we can use other plants as fertilizers though. Um, without even having to use a synthetic fertilizer, we can use plants that are already growing in our yards to help give nutrients to other plants. So some examples are nitrogen fixers, which are generally in the Fabaceae, the, the bean and pea family. So beans, peas, uh, Baptisia, which is like your um, false blue indigo and which is a native plant. It's got beautiful flowers and seed pods and can be used for dye. That's where the indigo comes from. It can also come in cream and yellow and other colors, but um, that's a, a really nice plant that is a nitrogen fixer. Clover is another one and it's used a lot of times as a cover crop for that reason. It's also really good for um, feeding the bees. Even our redbud trees, which I love, they're so pretty in the springtime. Redbud trees are nitrogen fixing trees. So there are quite a few plants that you can add and what they do as a nitrogen fixer, they will actually take atmospheric nitrogen, meaning they're pulling nitrogen from the air and they can convert that into an available form in the roots to feed themselves and to feed the plants around them and actually add nitrogen to the soil. So then we've got another category of plants called dynamic accumulators. And these are typically plants that have a deep, long taproot. So what happens, and I, I like to use this example, we use these a lot in, um, in permaculture to when we're designing what's called a guild where different plants work together to do different purposes, different jobs, just like they would in nature. Um, you don't typically see just one thing growing as far as, you know, sometimes there's a stand of trees of the same type or a field of flowers of the same type, but there are generally a lot of other things mixed in there too. And so in this case, um, with fruit trees, with that example, the roots spread out wide and shallow. They're close to the surface of the ground. So they're getting all of their nutrients from up here in the top layer of the soil. If you plant near it, a dynamic accumulator with a deep long taproot, it's reaching farther down to a different layer of the soil and potentially mining different nutrients and minerals that may not be available in that upper surface at the top level there. So a lot of our plants with these shallower root systems, which tend to be our non-natives, a lot of our annual fruits and vegetables and things, um, they have a more shallow root system as opposed to, for example, some of our native prairie plants that have just the roots go down feet, like 20 feet, <laughs> you know, really deep. So when we have some things that are feeding from the top surface, then it can be really beneficial to have other plants that are pulling nutrients from farther down. Once they pull all those nutrients in, they're not just held in the roots, they're coming up into the stems, the stalks, and the leaves of the plants. Now you've got all this biomass, this organic matter that can be composted. It can be cut and laid down on the surface of the ground in the method that we call chop and drop, which means chopping the plant down, dropping it on the ground and letting it compost in place because all of those nutrients then that it's pulled from deeper down are now in those leaves that you laid on the top surface. And as it breaks down, it's adding those nutrients back to the top layer, the top level of the soil. So it's really a good idea when you have certain plants like this, um, Dandelions have a deep tap root, if, especially if you're pulling them anyway, um, you know, if you don't want them in your yard. Dandelions are often used as a compost stimulator, like they kind of are a, a jump start because of all the nutrients that they hold. So you can throw those in your compost pile. And especially if you're doing it when the flower is yellow, like in this picture here, rather than, you know, when it's white and full of seeds, you might not want to add that to your compost. But when it's and when it hasn't gotten to that seeding stage yet, you can. This is another reason that dandelions are so healthy. They're, it's a healthful plant for us to actually eat. So the leaves, the flowers, um, the roots, they all, all the different parts have different health benefits for eating. And it's because they are so chock full of all those nutrients 
that's the same reason that it's a good additive for your compost or a good plant that you can pull and just leave on the top of the soil, let it break down and add those nutrients back to your soil. And you can tuck it under some of your mulch or you know, however you wanna do it. But uh, if you just don't wanna leave weeds laying on the top of your, your um, garden beds, you can definitely pull them and then either compost them or tuck them underneath some mulch, that's fine. Comfrey is another plant that is great for the chop and drop method because it grows very quickly. So you can chop it down, lay it down on the ground and it will grow back. And you can do this several times throughout the season. So the variety that is typically used is a Russian bucking, I wanna say 14, I always forget the number. Um, and that one does not spread like crazy. So it's not going to take over your yard but it does have that really fast growth. So if you chop it down, it comes right back. Chop it down, it comes right back. So you get all this material that you can keep adding to your soil and adding those nutrients back to the surface of your soil or to your compost pile. Borage is another one, another great plant. It's great for bees. Um, it's edible. Flowers, the edible flowers, they're blue. They're beautiful, little star shape. Lamb's quarters, that's uh, commonly thought of as a weed. It's another edible weed. Uh, it's like a summer spinach, and that's another really good one that can add nutrients back to your soil. So if you're pulling these weeds anyway, if you toss them in your compost or lay them down on the ground like a chop and drop method, then um, that can be really beneficial in adding nutrients to your plants that you are trying to grow. And so I also have a picture on here of stinging nettles, which, you know, some people would think, why would you ever want to grow stinging nettles in your, in your yard or in your garden? They are a fantastic food source. They are used in cooking. They're used in all kinds of different medicinal um, or used for different medicinal purposes, but they also are very commonly used to make a fertilizer, a liquid fertilizer. So you can chop down the nettles and steep them in water to make like a tea. This is not a compost tea. This is just making a tea that's really pulling the nutrients out of those leaves. And then you pour it on your plants as a liquid fertilizer. You can use it as a foliar spray. Um, and this is actually in other countries, um, Ireland, for example, nettles grow crazy and they do this all the time. And they also use seaweed because it's readily available, a lot of nutrients and minerals in there. And they'll use that as mulch, as a chop and drop, as you know, fertilizer for their other plants. So sometimes the fertilizers you need are right there in front of you anyway. And a lot of times we're actually trying to get rid of them um, <laughs> when we really could just be using them for other purposes. So in our efforts to eliminate these different things that we're adding, we can also eliminate our use of herbicides. So I mentioned that some of those things are weeds that we're pulling anyway. So if we pull them and use them rather than trying to spray them with anything, that's already a benefit. If we pull them and eat them, we can do that too. Certain ones, like I mentioned, are edible and they're actually, some are delicious and some are very nutritious and some are medicinal. But beyond that, if we have other weeds that we're not using, and you know what, actually on that note, since I mentioned the nettles and the, um, the lamb's quarters, I do want to mention one more edible weed without going on too much of a tangent on that, but purslane is another of my favorites because it is, it's actually commonly used for culinary purposes in other places and other countries. But here, a lot of people don't realize that and we think of it just as a weed and pull it and get rid of it. And it's such a shame. It's actually, it contains the highest amount of amino three um, fatty acids, or omegas, I'm sorry, omega-3 fatty acids um, of any plant that is known so far. So of all plants, purslane has the highest level of omega-3 fatty acids. So it's a great thing to toss in a salad. You can cook with it. So one more, one more weed that um, has more benefits than, than harm, in my opinion. Um, but in terms of getting rid of the weeds that we don't want, if we get them while they're small, it's so much easier to prevent them than it is to try to, to tackle them later, especially if you think about something like, if you guys have ever had dock come up in your garden, oh my gosh, talk about a deep tap root and another, you know, like for chop and drop plants, those roots go so far down, they can be very difficult to dig out, but they're much easier when they're small. 
And so I've got this picture here, this lower left, this tool. I don't know if any of you guys use this. It's a stirrup hoe. It's a great tool for clearing weeds from your beds when, um, when they're really small. So it's got a little blade on each side and you just kind of go back and forth like this, like you're mopping the floor. And that blade just goes right at the surface level of the soil and just cuts down any young little weed seeds, um, seedlings as they pop up before they can do anything. Do that to prep your bed a couple of times in the spring and you've already taken care of a lot of your seed bank because as it's sprouting, you're getting them out immediately. And then you don't have to spray anything and you don't have to dig out big plants later on. You can also use a biodegradable weed barrier. So I know, um, you know, some people are a fan of using plastic. I personally am not. I just don't want to use petroleum products in general if I can avoid it. However, um, if you are using plastic, as long as it's something that's going to last a long time and, you know, that can be reused over and over, I just don't want to create waste. Again, I'm trying to keep things on site and not, um, not be adding to landfills or there's certain products that really just they don't last and they end up going in the garbage. And I just try to avoid those if I can. But cardboard does a wonderful job. Um, my grandma used to use newspaper all the time in her garden. And I never understood why when I was really little. I thought that was weird. Why is she putting the newspaper in her garden? But it makes complete sense to me now. And um, so I'm a big fan. And you just have to be careful. You don't want to use any of the shiny paper, like the ads that are shiny or like magazine type paper. Um, but just plain cardboard, like as shown there, or plain black and white newspapers. Most newspapers are printed with a, um, a vegetable-based ink rather than um, lead-based. And some of the colors and things like that, I'm, I'm not comfortable with those. I don't trust them. And I've, you know, there's some evidence that some of those could be harmful. And I just don't want to put anything bad into the, into the soil or into the garden. So um, just plain cardboard. But that it does a really good job of keeping weeds down. And right now, this time of year, if you're thinking of starting a new garden bed for next year um, and you have it kind of eyeballed and you know the area you want to grow, but you know you're gonna have to get rid of all this grass, right now is a great time to do this. So sheet mulching, we call it, or you may have heard of lasagna gardening, which is also it's the same idea. What you're doing basically is layering. So in this case, right over the top of the grass, we're going with cardboard. If you needed any type of soil amendment, um, which is typically only like if, you, if you've if you had a soil test done and you know that your soil is deficient in something and you need to amend, then, then that's great. Then you can even add that to the bottom and then do the cardboard on top. A lot of times um, we don't actually have a lot of issues with nutrient deficiencies um, to a a point where we have to add a whole lot. But if you have done a soil test and you know you need an amendment, then you can put that down first, then put the cardboard on top, then you can add your organic materials. So it can be like your grass clippings, your leaves that you know you just raked up out of the yard. You can put compost down and then over the top of it, you can do straw, you can do wood chips and you just let it sit in place all winter long and that cardboard and everything on top of it is going to smother out the grass. You don't have to dig anything. You don't have to take it out. It will smother the grass and kill it and it actually will compost it in place. So the worms will come up and for whatever reason, they love the cardboard. It just creates this nice environment and you'll end up seeing so many earthworms underneath there and they really will help to quickly start mixing all of these things um, and breaking down the grass and things that are underneath there that have been smothered out and composting all of that right in place. And then after we've had snows and thaws and snow and thaw and rain and warm and cold and all of this over the winter, then in the springtime, you'll go out and pull back some of that mulch and look underneath and you'll see that that cardboard is breaking down. Over time, it will disappear completely it just becomes worm food and adds, um, adds to the soil. And then you've got a garden bed that's ready to plant in in the spring. And you can even, if you wanted to add soil to the top, you could, depending on what you're growing, you can just move back your mulch and add some soil and plant right in it and then mulch back around it. Or um, if you're planting something more like a shrub or a tree, you can just 
cut, you know, right through that cardboard because it'll be soggy and breaking down by that point and disappearing. So you can just dig your hole right through it, plant in place, and then mulch back around it. So you shouldn't have to need, you don't need to add soil to the top if you're planting into the existing soil underneath in the spring. But if you're planting like little seeds or something and you need a little bit of garden soil up at the top, you can certainly just move your mulch aside, add a little soil and plant your seeds and then, and then grow. But either way, you've got a whole garden bed that's ready without doing any digging and without having to um, use any herbicides to try to kill all of the grass or the weeds or anything that were, that were under that area. Um, wood chips, I will say too, side note on that, a lot of times people get nervous, they don't want to use wood chips because they think it's going to lock up the nitrogen. There is some truth to that. Um, as I mentioned with the composting, we have carbon and nitrogen and you have to have a balance in order for the, um, it, it uses up the nitrogen and in order to break down the carbon like the wood chips. So it can pull, basically lock up nitrogen from the soil in the efforts to break down that wood. So what you wanna do is just make sure it's on the top. You just don't want to mix those wood chips into your soil. That, that's when you would have that issue. But if you're only using it on the top as a mulch and you're careful not to have that be dug into your soil, then you're fine. And that's really not, I've never had an issue where I've had a nitrogen you know, problem or deficiency because I've used wood chips as a mulch on top. You just don't wanna mix it into your soil. Um, and so other ways to eliminate herbicides would be using natural ground covers. So you can use um, a living ground cover, like a clover or a lissom, some type of low growing plant. It could be maybe a creeping thyme, whatever it is, something that's going to spread and cover the soil so that it's not allowing any bare space. You're not giving weeds any room to grow. Um, no bare soil. So if you have the soil covered, you're not giving the weeds as much of an opportunity to flourish because there's already something growing there. So there's really no room. So some other options too, and I, I do like some of these. So the, um, the boiling water, this is another one that another one of my grandmas used to use. And this I think works really great for, like if you have weeds that come up in between patio stones or sidewalk cracks or things like that, you can add, you know, pour some boiling water from your tea kettle onto them and, and, and kill it that way. This isn't going to necessarily do the job if we're talking about something big, like I mentioned, that dock plant that can be as tall as I am and, you know, have a really deep root, might do a little damage, but it probably won't kill it all the way. Um, and that's the same with the vinegar. You may use vinegar for those same small little weeds that come up maybe between your patio stones or wherever. Um, but the problem, and you, there are stronger vinegars. You can use a household kitchen vinegar, but there is a much stronger concentrated vinegar that you can actually buy in the garden centers and it's labeled, you know, it's an organic herbicide basically is what it's sold as. It's just a concentrated vinegar. The only issue I have with that is that the way that really works is you're, you're changing the soil condition, the pH drastically. So while initially you might see whatever weeds were there will die off and be gone, you might see a whole different kind of weed pop up a couple of weeks later because now you've just, you know, right at the top of the surface there, you've just changed the pH level and a different seed might thrive in that. So you might get rid of one weed and have a different one pop up. That's definitely been known to happen with the vinegar method. Salt is another method, but then you need to be careful and make sure you don't want to use that where you're trying to grow something else. So some of these, you know, they're, they're not, um, they're indiscriminate. So they might kill the weeds, but they might kill your good plants too. So they may not all be ideal options. It depends on the application, but these are, these are different, um, definitely different tools in your toolbox that are, that are available to, to choose from. The flame weeder is great. <laughs> flame weeder, that sounds so fun. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of those, but it's, um, it's like a long handle and it's basically like a little blowtorch at the end of it. Um, and there are farm scale ones too, where there's a whole thing on the back of a tractor with a whole bunch of flames that just psh, come down and, and will burn um, all of the little seeds that are, you know, thinking about sprouting in um, the planting area. But there are handheld ones that you can use on a smaller scale as well in your yard. And 
what these are really ideal for, again, if you're trying to weed in between plants that you already have growing, you might damage your own plants with that flame weeder also, uh, the ones that you want to be there. So what this is actually really good for is if you're prepping a seed bed in the spring, a lot of times um, we'll use this to, like if, you, if you prep the seed bed and you get it all ready, but you haven't planted in it yet, give it a few days or a week and see what weed, spree, weed seeds sprout up on their own. Then you come through with the flame weeder and clear the bed, give it another week and let it happen again. And once you know, you've got little weed sprouts in there for the second time, flame weed it again. Now you've just done two rounds of eliminating all of your weeds that were going to pop up that summer because there are already seeds in the seed bank in your soil. So what you're doing is allowing them to sprout, but then killing them off. You allow them to sprout, kill them off again, and then, um, and then you can go in and plant your seeds and all of those weeds have already been eliminated before you've even started. So in addition to eliminating our herbicides, we also try to work on eliminating our pesticide use. And one of the best ways to do this, or one of my preferred ways is through companion planting. So there are all kinds of different things we can do with companion planting, sometimes just physically in, in the process of companion planting, that means you've got, instead of um, say, you know, six cabbages in a row, you've got a cabbage with dill and then a marigold and then something else and then another cabbage. So just the way they're physically spaced by having other plants around them, you're spreading apart those cabbages so that if a pest comes to one, it doesn't have a whole bunch more right next to it that it's going to be attacking. It's going to take some work for it to find that next one that's down the row. So it's a physical barrier for one thing. And then in addition to that, it can confuse the pests in terms of different scents. Um, if it is honing in on one thing that it wants to eat, sometimes if there are aromatics around it, whether it be herbs or flowers, whatever you've planted near it, um, it can disguise the rest of the plant that it wants to eat. So it makes it harder to find it that way as well. Um, so certain plants are natural repellents and that could be the same the same could be said for people eating these things as well, <laughs> onions, garlic. Um, so, you know, we, we might repel somebody with our breath that can be very strong. If we ate a lot of raw onions or we had, you know, a meal with a lot of garlic, they have very strong odors. And so those things can act as repellents to pests as well. So, and that's not just insect pests. We, um, another tip from my grandma, um, she used to plant, and we still have a ton of it in my parents' yard around where their old garden used to be. There's a whole garlic patch because she used to plant garlic around the entire perimeter of the garden to keep the rabbits out because the rabbits would come and they would smell the garlic and not really want to go any further. So it would help. It was one more layer of protection for the garden that would keep them away from the plants inside that, that they may have wanted to eat. So those things can repel insects and animal pests. They can also um, they can also repel pests under the soil. So that's really beneficial sometimes also depending on what you're trying to grow. So um, marigolds are the same way. So some of these things help with um, preventing harmful nematodes and things under the soil. And a benefit is they're edible. So it can be part of your garden and part of your pest control solutions all in one. Marigolds and nasturtiums, obviously the onions, the garlic and the chives, all of those things are edible. Um, for marigolds, it's the flower petals, nasturtiums, it's the leaves and the flowers. And then also our strong smelling aromatic herbs. So that can be lavender, it could be, I mentioned dill, um, a lot of those things, cilantro, anything that has a, a strong fragrance can be used to help deter some pests. And then we can also use some of those things to attract beneficial insects. So we usually are very familiar with attracting our pollinators, um, but we tend to sometimes not really take it any further than that. And there are so many other beneficial insects too that, um, that are really good to attract to our gardens. So we've got the picture here of the green lacewing. 
the ladybug. So those can both eat aphids. Um, so there are all kinds of different, um, different insects that we might want to attract for other reasons aside from pollination. One of my favorites, um, and I think I've got it on a different slide, it's, uh, it's kind of an unsung hero in the garden, um, are wasps. So, and I'm talking about the regular wasps. So I'll get to this little hornworm guy here in a second because that's a different type of wasp. Um, but um, the wasps with the legs that hang down, of course, here I am. I don't know the name of the, <laughs> the wasp I'm trying to think of. It's so very official, you know, the wasps with the legs. Um, so those wasps that people tend to be afraid of and don't want around and they try to get rid of the wasp nests and they, um, they want to eliminate any, any type of a wasp, which I do understand, we don't want to get stung, we don't want them by our doorways and things like that, I get that. However, if they're minding their own business and flying around our garden, watch what they do. Pay attention. If you see a wasp in your garden, they are hunting. They are fantastic predators of garden pests. So especially if you're trying to grow any brassicas, things in the brassica family, your kale um, and like kohlrabi and um, broccoli and all of those types of plants, the, the cabbage worms, you know, you see those beautiful cabbage whites, the little butterflies that fly around and then they stop on all of your, um, all of your plants in that family and they lay their eggs and then they get these little green caterpillars that will decimate your plants. Wasps love to eat those. So you'll see them hovering around and, and they know they go under the leaves where a lot of times those little caterpillars are hard to find because they go right in the leaf vein and they blend in so well, it's hard to spot them and you know pick them off all by hand. But those wasps are really good at finding them and they will actually go underneath the leaves and pull them off the undersides and carry them away and eat them. So they are fantastic to have in the garden. Um, definitely some of the things that we think of as pests are actually our helpers. So some things that can help attract beneficial insects would be um, cilantro, dill, yarrow, fennel, all of these things. Um, if you guys have grown a lot of these things like um, the dill, the fennel, um, parsley, you may have seen swallowtail caterpillars in your garden. So we know that those are host plants for certain things, but they're also host plants, not just for beautiful butterflies that um, you know we love for their beauty and they do help with pollination, but they're also host plants for a lot of other beneficial insects. So all of these things are fantastic to mix in your gardens. And so I like to mix the, the idea of organic gardening and companion planting, um, mix that with some French intensive method, if you guys are familiar with that at all, and with um, like a potager style. So you've got your flowers, your fruits, your vegetables, your herbs, all of these things all in the same space. I think they look really pretty that way. It makes, um, makes a beautiful garden and it does so much more work and can be so much more productive for you with less work on your part because it's you're just, you're just balancing the system. You're adding in all of these other plants that have all these benefits and bring in um, the, the little insect predators and the pollinators and all the things that you need to help do these jobs so that you don't have to do it or go buy products to do it. Um, so this hornworm, I'm sure if any of you grow tomatoes, you may have seen these at some point. And <laughs> I remember the very first time I ever saw one of these, I had a tiny little garden. This was a long, long time ago. And I went out and I had peas on a trellis and they were next to, I had, you know, again, it was like an eight by eight little square garden. And so I had a variety of plants in the small space and there was a tomato plant right next to where I had this trellis with peas. I reached out thinking I was about to pick a big fat pea pod. It was not a pea pod. It was one of these hornworms. <laughs> scared me. I, I think that was the first time I'd ever seen one. Like, oh, never forget that. And um, these even if you don't happen to see the hornworm first, you'll typically see the damage they're doing. So the hornworm, you might have a beautiful, healthy, happy tomato plant one day, and then the next day you go out to your garden and half of the, you know, side branches on your tomato plant are gone, just gone. <laughs> they eat a lot. They eat quickly. They do a lot of damage. So a lot of times you'll see the damage before you'll see the hornworm. You can, um, pick them off by hand and people will go out at night with the black light because um, these guys will actually kind of glow with the black light. So if you go out at nighttime with the black light, it's much easier to spot them because they do really blend in well with your plants. They're the perfect green color to blend in with your tomato plants. 
So if you go out with a black light at night, you can find them and pick them off by hand. Gross. I prefer to go with this route, as in this picture here. There's a tiny little other type of wasp. They're called, if I pronounce it correctly, braconid wasps. And they are, there are thousands of species. There's thousands of varieties. And they, um, they all, they're parasitic wasps, and they all have different hosts. So some will go after, you know, um, even aphids, and some go after hornworms. They're all kind of specific. So the ones that go after these hornworms, and these are tiny. So when I say wasp, these are not the ones that I was talking about that are going around hunting the, the little caterpillars and cabbage worms. These are tiny, non-stinging little wasps, very beneficial. You've probably seen them before and didn't even realize it was a wasp, that it was in that family. They're parasitic, so what they do is they lay their eggs on the hornworm, actually in the hornworm, right underneath its skin there, and those eggs will hatch and they're parasitizing this, this hornworm. They're working on killing it, and then when they are ready to pupate, they come out through the skin and they make these little cocoons on the hornworm's back. If you see that with all those little white things on the hornworm's back, that hornworm is dead anyway. You don't have to do anything. If you want to remove it so it doesn't keep chomping on your plant in the meantime, you can, but it, it's only got a very short time left and it's on its way out. So while that may not have prevented some of the damage that's already happened to your plant, it is breaking the life cycle and that hornworm now is not able to reproduce and fill your garden with more hornworms that will eat all of your tomato plants. So that's an example of balance in the ecosystem. If you can allow your garden to develop in a way where it can kind of create its own balance. When I saw this, I knew I didn't have to do anything. I, I saw that the hornworm was there, that, that's a problem. But if I can take a step back and kind of get out of the mindset of, um, you know, that constant vigilance, and like, ah, go after everything right away, that can be stressful for us, but it can also be unnecessary because in this case, I didn't have to do anything. Nature took its course and took care of the pest problem for me. So I didn't have to do any management there. And I actually, that, I haven't seen any hornworms since. Now, some people actually like these because they grow up to be a sphinx moth, which is very cool. Um, however, if, you know, you don't necessarily want them eating your tomatoes. So that's a, that's a choice there. There's a balance. Maybe if you can relocate it, I don't know that's got another plant that it likes to eat, then that's fine, but they will do a lot of damage. So, but this was a case where it, the problem managed itself. Nature, when allowed to be in balance and to do its work on its own, can do amazing things and save us a lot of work. So another way we can eliminate pesticides is by using physical barriers. So I mentioned the little cabbage white butterflies. I have learned my lesson over the years um, I now, for the most part, only grow my brassicas under cover. So that's everything in that family. That would be broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. My kohlrabi doesn't seem to get bothered too much, and you're really eating the bulb on that rather than the leaves. So if the leaves get a little nibbled, I'm not too worried. So those are an exception. But cabbages, kales, all of those things, I grow under cover because it's a physical barrier that keeps those little cabbage white butterflies from landing on my plants and laying their eggs. So if you can create a barrier to stop those things from ever getting to your plants, then that can be a huge benefit to you, save a lot of time and effort, and avoid using pesticides. So another thing um, that, well, that can also apply to um, the fencing. So to keep deer or rabbits out or um, covers, that um, if you guys have seen like for raised beds like this, there are uh, frames that can be made to go over. So they're cold frames, but that's for a whole nother purpose and season extension. But there are frames that have like a hardware cloth, you know, small wire, little squares that will keep out squirrels and chipmunks because fencing might keep a rabbit out, but squirrels and chipmunks will just go right over the top of it, just climb right over and get in. So there are actual little cages that you can put over your bed that will help keep some of those pests out. So physical barriers, keeping them away from your plants. And then there are things um, like sticky traps. And I always clarify on this, there are some sticky traps that are used to catch things like rodents. And I, I don't like those at all. That is not what I'm talking about. Um, 
I am not a fan. So when I'm talking about sticky traps, these are very lightly sticky. Think of more like painter's tape and how it's not, it's tacky, but it's not really that sticky. It comes off easily. So these, you know, if an animal went across it, it's not going to even, it, it's not going to get stuck, but they're made specifically for things like flea beetles. Um, so it just lays on the surface of the soil around your plants so that as those little flea beetles, which if you guys have seen those, they're teeny tiny, they kind of look like fleas, but they're not, and, but they hop all over. So they might be happily munching on your plants. And then when you walk over to your garden bed, all of a sudden you'll see them all, bing, 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 you know, jumping all over. So that's what those sticky traps are for. So that when they're hopping off the plants, they'll stick to those traps and then you can just throw them away. So it's a non pesticide, you know, chemical pesticide way of um, reducing the amount of pests that are actually jumping onto your plants. And then like I mentioned with the hornworms too, um, or with the cabbage worms, you can physically remove some of these pests by hand. Um, I also have backyard chickens and they love if I find a cabbage worm. And um, unfortunately though, they do not like to eat hornworms. They're not interested, <laughs> even they don't like those things. Um, but that's great too, keeping them as part of your system. That's another, which I'll talk about in a second. I love chickens in the, in the yard if you're living in a place that allows them. Um, they can be very beneficial too in helping keep down your weeds and your insect pests. Um, and then increasing the biodiversity in your space. So diversity equals resilience. If you have frogs and toads, they eat so many pests. If you have a slug problem, um, you really have a toad deficiency. <laughs> so it's better to um, provide the habitat and attract the wildlife that can help you. So if you can have toads in your yard that are eating those slugs, again, then you don't need to worry about products like sluggo and things that we don't necessarily want to use. Um, and then frogs, if you have like a little backyard pond or a wet area, or if you have little frogs, they eat a lot of bugs. They're, they're fantastic help to us. Toads also will even eat big things um, that, that some of the other things don't want to eat. Like they'll eat grasshoppers and, and crickets and those big like locust cricket things, or not crickets, grasshoppers. Um, they'll eat those and a lot of other things don't. They're big. Um, a lot of the backyard birds don't eat them. So, and then speaking of backyard birds, if you can attract specifically bluebirds and wrens are two birds that are fantastic at eating insects that bother your garden. They aren't, um, you know, some birds like to eat seeds and some like insects. The, the bluebirds and the wrens are great garden helpers. So if you're trying to attract those things to your yard, then, um, you do need to get the birdhouses that are made specifically for those birds. They have to have the, the entrance hole on the house has to be the right size for the bird you're trying to attract. Um, so I would do a little research and look into that and see like, you know, maybe what type of pests do you have? What type of insects do these guys eat? What would be good for you to attract? One, both, you know, one or the other. I have wrens in my yard and I love them, but I, I would like to get a bluebird house. I would love to attract some bluebirds as well. Um, and then I mentioned the wasps before, and also garden spiders, especially if you guys have ever seen um, sometimes the really big black and yellow garden spiders. If you see the really big one, that's the female. And then usually there's a little satellite web or two or three next to hers, the big one with the smaller spider, and those are the males. Those, um, those are great in the garden. They catch so many insects, so many pests. I seem to have them um, around my raspberries and blackberries pretty often, which is fantastic. So they catch a lot of the pests that would normally be, um, be bothering my fruit. So I like those a lot. Snakes also, I know some people aren't fans. I love snakes. They are so beneficial in the yard. They will eat all kinds of pests. Again, those crickets, grasshoppers, um, big pests. They'll eat slugs. They'll eat mice and voles, especially if you're trying to grow any um, fruit trees or shrubs or, you know, you have winter damage from little mice and voles and, and rodents that, that get at the, the trunks and the bark and things like that. Um, not that snakes are out in the winter, but just in general and keeping the population down of those types of things. Um, even, you know, hawks and things that will keep the, the resident uh, chipmunks in check a little bit. You know, it's just 
being able to support our ecosystem again and attract wildlife that helps us in the garden um, benefits them, benefits us, makes our jobs easier. Obviously, there are some things that we can attract that could do damage to our garden, but these specifically are some of the things that, that can help us out a lot. And so I mentioned my backyard hens, and I, I really like their part that they play in the garden. First of all, they're part of my compost crew. So they will um, eat a lot of the kitchen scraps before it even has to go to the compost bin. Things that they don't eat will go to the compost bin, but the chickens are the first step. So they'll eat a lot of the scraps and then between their bedding and their waste, um, that then all goes into the compost pile and adds, um, they're high in nitrogen, they're, the waste from the chickens, their manure is high in nitrogen. So it definitely gets that compost pile going and you need the carbons to balance that out and uh, keep a good, a good system going and have it processed quickly to be able to use it the next year in the garden. Um, but it's, it's great to have. And um, another thing we can do to eliminate our, oh, well, actually, before I even get to that, um, just with the chickens, aside from the composting help, they also eat insects and weeds, as I was mentioning before. And what I like to do is let them use their natural behaviors. So if I need to spread some compost, now I would do this in the fall because I follow all of the organic guidelines from um, USDA certification in terms of how long between letting, uh, you know, different types of livestock into a growing area, how long do you have to have it, um, you know, sit before you can grow something in that soil because you have to have time for any droppings to compost down and be safe. Um, for food safety concerns. So I would let them go through like at the beginning of October, spread compost in a bed that's finished for the year. And they, they are, you know, it's their natural behavior to go in and scratch and peck. And so they're eating weed seeds and they're spreading the compost around for me and they're mixing it with the soil and they're dropping manure as they go. And they're, they're doing all this work. And then they move on to the next section and, um, and that sits all winter long and then in the spring, you know, it's been months, and then I can go and plant in it. And um, so they're just part of that system. They're, they can be very beneficial aside from being entertaining and providing eggs. Um, so in terms of eliminating our pesticides, though, crop rotation is another thing that we, we tend to think of crop rotation as being useful for purposes of um, nutrients and not depleting the nutrients in a certain bed or a certain growing area but it's also important for breaking insect life cycles. Um, so if we grow something in this bed this year, then maybe it should be in a different bed next year so that if a pest found it here and it's trying to overwinter, when it wakes up next spring, its host plant isn't there anymore because now it's growing all the way on the other side, you know, somewhere over here. So rotating helps to break those patterns and those life cycles of certain pests as well. And then it also um, can work in terms of succession planting, which I'll talk about in a second too. So decoys and trap crops are another method I like to use. And I've got two examples just from last year and this year that, um, that worked out really nicely for this. A decoy or a trap crop is when you grow something for the purpose of attracting the pests to that thing so that it, they leave something else alone. So one example, I had some smart weed that popped up in my yard and it's got these little pink flowers on it. Yes, it has the word weed in it, but in the name, but that's okay. I, I like them. I think they're, they're pretty and it didn't bother me. So they're not really hard to control or anything. So I, I just left it alone. I left the smart weed there. And I ended up being really glad I did because it turned out that the Japanese beetles that showed up in my yard loved the smartweed. And so they left my hollyhocks alone that the smartweed was growing next to. And if any of you grow hollyhocks ever, you may have seen, I mean, the Japanese beetles love them and can just destroy them. So um, yeah, they just skeletonize the leaves completely and, and destroy the flowers and everything else. They chomp on them and they're, they're perfectly happy to eat hollyhocks all day long. But it turned out that even with hollyhocks being right there, they preferred the smartweed. So that worked out great as a trap crop for me. So now I know smartweed gets to go near anything that 
um, that the Japanese beetles usually like to attack in my yard. And then I don't need to worry about it. Let them make the smart weed, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. The other thing that this happened with was in the Conservation Foundation's new children's garden this year, we had a bed with cucumbers growing on a trellis. And then we had some green onions and we had nasturtium growing around the base. Nasturtium, they're a great, um, a great companion plant for cucumbers, anything that cucurbit family. Um, so cucumbers and melons and um, squash and things like that. So we had some cucumber beetles show up and we had some flea beetles show up. It turned out, luckily, and these are cucumber beetles, you would think, if anything, they would love to eat the cucumber plants. I mean, it's in the name, but they actually really liked the nasturtium, and so did the flea beetles. So the nasturtium was attracting the pests. The cucumbers ended up being fine. We hardly had any damage. And then I went in and ended up doing one very light, mild treatment with diatomaceous earth on those flea beetles on the nasturtium. Um, and and then we, we didn't have a problem for the rest of the season. It kind of concentrated them all to these nasturtium plants. We were able to take care of it there. It worked as a trap and it saved the other plants because they were more attracted to the trap plant. And then the nasturtiums, even though they had been pretty chewed up, they bounced back beautifully after that one treatment and the flea beetles were gone and everything was fine. The cucumber beetles didn't come back and it, it was great. So the whole rest of the season, we didn't have any issues there. Um, so trap crops can definitely be very beneficial. And then adjusting our planting dates can also help. And this kind of goes along with succession planting. So again, it's knowing the life cycle of a pest. So for example, if you're growing zucchini and you know that you always every year get, um, you know, your zucchini gets attacked by squash bugs and squash vine borers. If you know the life cycle of those insects, you can work around it and adjust your planting dates so that um, you're planting after. So for example, if you, you know, squash vine borers, they come out of the soil and get into the, um, the vine, into the stem in mid-June. Maybe keep your, your starts in, you know, in a different spot. Don't put them into the ground until a little bit later in June. And at that point, all of those have already come out of the soil. You've kind of missed them, and then you're putting your plants into the ground. Um, and that can really help to prevent some of those attacks. But you can also do something um, with your succession planting. You can plan for a short life or plan, kind of plan for a failure with some of your plants. So again, with the zucchinis as an example, what I usually like to do, another problem that people have with their zucchini plants, which is very common, it's totally normal in this area, um, just with our climate and the, the moisture levels we have, the amount of rain we have during our, our growing season and the humidity levels and all of that, um, a lot of people have issues with powdery mildew on their zucchini plants. So we've got squash vine borers, we've got um, squash bugs, we've got powdery mildew, and people can pull their hair out trying to save their squash plants and their zucchinis because they're just fighting to try to um, get these plants to live when they're being, you know, they're under attack by all these other things. So what I like to do is I plant my zucchinis, and this also goes for yellow squash, patty pans, all of your summer squash like that. Plant those, and then once those first, that first round of plants is flowering, as soon as they're flowering, I pop my seeds in the ground in another section of my garden for round two. And what happens that way is that by the time round one may be getting attacked by some of these things, my round two is flowering and fruiting now. So round one just comes out, something else goes in its place, and I still have squash, I've got zucchini over there. So you can plan a little bit to kind of um, strategically plan your successions and your planting dates to either have another set going when the first one starts to struggle so you don't completely lose your harvests, or just plant around the pests instead of planting at the time when you're basically putting food on their plate and saying, here, please eat my plants. You can avoid that just by planting a little bit, usually later, sometimes earlier, but usually later, adjusting your planting dates. And then finally, if all else fails, <laughs> you've tried all of those other methods, all of those other things, and 
you just really need, um, you need something else you actually need to use some kind of a product, there are organic products that you can use in the garden. Um, so we're used to looking when we're buying food items, we look for that USDA organic seal. Uh, so if you're buying products for the garden, you can look for that seal too, but that's that's for your food. This is for your um, your actual products to use in your garden. You want to look for that label that says OMRI, OMRI listed. So that's the Organic Materials uh, Review Institute. And so OMRI approved items mean that they are approved for organic use, even for people with organic certifications who have to follow those stringent rules. Um, so definitely look for that, that label. And then, if so if you're buying products, you wanna look for that label. You can also make some of your own products. So there are certain things that are very simple, old school recipes. Some of them work great. Some of them, eh, you know, maybe, maybe a little trial and error and see what works for you or what works with your particular challenge that you're facing, whatever pest or whatever it is that you're dealing with. Um, garlic, you can actually take cloves of garlic mash it up like if you have one of those tools you know to um really finely like a garlic press to really finely um you know make the little tiny pieces of garlic and then soak it in some water like you're making a garlic tea do just let it sit there for a day or so and then strain out all of the garlic material and just use that garlic water you can spray that on your plants outside and it will keep some pests away and it will keep rabbits away not 100%, but it, it has been effective. This has worked very well for me in the past. There are actually even commercial products that are sold that are made just from garlic juice that are used to control mosquito populations, like, you know, as a spray for your yard, as opposed to using, um, you know, a fogger. There are different garlic juice um, products that you can use to help control some of those insects. So it, it does, it does work. Um, and then also hot peppers. You guys may have heard of some of these. You can either use cayenne pepper like powdered and sprinkle it around plants that some animals are trying to eat or you can make a, a pepper spray also like the garlic spray but be very careful that you don't breathe that in. It is what it sounds like, pepper spray. I mean if you blow that and you're downwind and it blows back at you, you know, <laughs> that's not, that's not gonna be good. You don't want to breathe that. Um, but you can, you know, just to get it on the surface of your plants, if you've had bunnies nibbling or something, sometimes hot peppers are a good um, natural way to deter some of that. And then dish soap, sometimes a drop or two of dish soap is added to some of these homemade recipes. It's not so much that the dish soap is necessarily doing anything for the pests, it just helps those things stick to the leaves. So that, that can be good or bad. Some plants don't like that. They don't want stuff on their leaves like that. Um, but those are, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of things that you can find for homemade recipes. Um, and then there are also things that you can buy that are made with natural ingredients. Um, but as I've got noted on here, and I'll tell you why, even if it's labeled organic, I still use these sparingly, if at all. So there are certain things, um, neem oil, neem is a plant, so neem oil is plant derived. Bt that is used for those cabbage worms, like I mentioned, and other soft-bodied insects. It's actually a bacteria, um, and so that it's natural. Um, diatomaceous earth is a powder, and it's um, fossilized diatoms. They're tiny, tiny little um, little creatures that are now powdered, you know, fossilized and powdered. And they, under a microscope, if you could look at them very, very closely, they have very sharp edges. So they're not good for us to breathe in but they also then will harm those soft-bodied insects that um, try to crawl across it or ingest it. And um, it's sharp, it's almost like glass for them. So that's harmful to them. The issue with these things, not only, you know, like I mentioned with the diatomaceous earth, that that's not good for us to breathe in and we need to take precautions just because it's organic doesn't mean it's 100% safe all the time for everyone in every circumstance or situation. Um, but in addition to that, again, it's indiscriminate. It doesn't know that it's going to kill the cabbage worm and not our honeybee. So um, I, like I mentioned, doing that one application of the diatomaceous earth on the nasturtium to try to get the, the crops um, or the, you know, as the trap crop to get those flea beetles. Um, what I did though, I had to wait until evening when the bees were not out and active. I wanted to apply it pretty precisely because I didn't want it anywhere near the flowers. 
that our pollinators are going to visit. I only wanted the flea beetles. <laughs> I didn't want the bees. So, you know, these things, even though they're natural, still try to avoid avoid any um, anything that I don't have to use. The more natural, the better. The less we have to use, the better. Um, so you do have these options in your in your tool belt or in your toolbox, but um, these are not my first go-to for, for those types of products just because they also have risks and they're not always 100% safe just because it's labeled organic. Um, yeah, so I just threw a whole lot at you guys. <laughs> I'm going to, if anybody wants me to go back to any, any slide, then just let me know and I can do that. But otherwise I will unshare the screen and just go back to our conversation, you know, our, our faces there and I can answer questions.